Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Anatomy and Physiology. Um, this is the second lecture in a series of urinary system videos that I'm doing. Again, with coronavirus shutdown, these are all impromptu, quick and, and, and um, crude, just to keep my, my class moving. So anyway, <clears throat> if you hear any barking or any noise in the background, please bear with me. All right, so in the last video, we went over the anatomy of the nephron. Quick review. We have the interlobar artery, arcuate artery, cortical radiate artery, afferent arterial, the capillary bed called the glomerulus, the efferent arterial here, and then the peritubular capillary, a venule, and the cortical radiate vein. We have the Bowman's capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. Now, um, a couple of things I want to get across first, anatomically speaking, and then we're going to do the functions of the kidney. Okay, we're going to trace some substances through here. Now, <clears throat> if I were to slice through the thick part of the tubule, the the um, well, before I get to this, let me let me mention this. There's a question in the note set and in a lot of textbooks, and people ask, what is the difference between what's called a cortical nephron and the juxtamedullary nephron? So. If I were to look at the kidney as a whole, so I'm going to draw another little picture in here. It has nothing to do with all of this, so to speak. But if this is the renal capsule, and here's my renal pyramid, here's a column and another renal pyramid, and so on and so forth. This would be the area called the medulla. This area going around here would be called the cortex. Now, these nephrons, if they're very high up here, and they have their Bowman's capsule, their proximal convoluted tubule, and their loop of Henle, like this, and then they'll have their collecting duct. If the nephron is very, very high up in the cortex, and a majority of them are, they're called cortical nephrons. Cortical nephrons have a little bit shorter loops of Henle, and they do a little bit more of the nutrient and ion reabsorption and all of that. They do reabsorb some water, but they, they do a less water reabsorption, and for, for a reason you'll see in just a second. Now, if this nephron were way down here, and then it has a long loop of Henle going down here, and then there's the collecting duct, then those are called juxtamedullary nephrons because they're next to the medulla. They're right near the top edge of the pyramids. Juxtamedullary nephrons have much longer loops of Henle. And since we do a lot of water reabsorption here, and some ions, they're going to do more water and ion balance and blood pressure and blood volume um, they have greater effects on blood pressure and blood volume and water and ion reabsorption than do these nephrons. You'll see why in just a second, okay? The other thing that I want to show you is this. If I were to slice through the proximal or distal convoluted tubule or what we call the thick parts of the loop of Henle, okay? So if I just drew this part of the loop of Henle right over here for a second, I have the thin part and I have the thick part. If I could cut across it, I would have a tube that has a hole in it. So if I were staring down on top, there's a hole here called the lumen, and the cells right around the edge are going to be cuboidal cells. It's simple cuboidal epithelium. When we studied simple cuboidal epithelium, one of the primary places we find it is hugging the, the tubule here. And those cells would be rather thick here like this, okay? And they actually have lots of microvilli, and it looks like the, the hairs on a brush, so they call them brush border cells. And those microvilli would be all the way around inside here. As you guys should know, microvilli increase surface area for absorption of things. And we're going to get some ions across here. So if I had one of these cuboidal cells with its microvilli, what the microvilli do is increase surface area for all these integral membrane proteins. Some of these integral membrane proteins are going to be ion channels. Some of them are going to be channels for different nutrients. And some of them are going to be pumps that have to use energy to pump things across. Give me a second. My dog is barking to get in. My apologies again. This happens frequently while I'm doing videos and I can't. No, I'm not going to ditch this video. So the thick parts of the loop of Henle have simple cuboidal epithelium, and those simple cuboidal cells have microvilli, so that let's say some nutrient is coming by here, if it bumps into that transport protein, it gets into the cell, and then there's going to be other transport molecules, proteins on this end, that are going to spit it back out so it can go back into the capillaries. Okay? Now, 
if I look at the thin parts of the loop of Henle, it is not lined with simple cuboidal epithelium. There's actually a thin layer of simple squamous epithelial cells here, like this. And if you remember from early in part one, squamous cells are very flat cells. If I were to slice through here and look at this end, the lumen is roughly the same size, but the walls are thinner because I have all these simple squamous cells making up the walls instead of the thicker simple cuboidal cells. So the thick part of the loops of Henle are going to have a lot of transport proteins on the microvilli and on the basal or surface of the cells, where the thin part is going to be much more permeable to other substances like water because it is so thin. Permeability, thin layers. Knowing that, that's going to help us understand what's going on and where it's happening inside of here. Now here's a simple way that I like to do this. I'm going to follow some substances through here, and I'm going to give each substance a number. The first thing I'm going to follow is nutrients. Now when I say nutrients, what we mean is things like glucose, amino acids, fatty acids and glycerol, and all of those things that we digested the major organic compounds into. So we're going to trace all those nutrients. So it's going to be things like glucose, it's going to be fatty acids plus glycerol, it's going to be amino acids, and it's even going to be vitamins. All these very essential things that we need. Okay. The second thing we're going to follow through here is going to be water, plain old water molecules. A third substance we're going to trace is going to be ions. When I say ions, you know I mean sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, iron, and other ions, okay? And ions are called electrolytes because they carry an electrical charge. So electrolytes, ions, minerals, all the same thing. And then the last thing we're going to follow is we're going to follow waste. Biological, organic waste, toxic waste. When I talk about waste, this is going to mean certain molecules. There's going to be some carbon dioxide, sometimes usually in the form of bicarbonate ion. Um, and most importantly, I'm going to leave CO2 out really, but there is some in there. We're going to have those amino groups, the amino ions. I'm going to have hydrogen ions or protons. Hydrogen ions are considered free radicals as are amino groups because of their charge and their strong, there's a strong nucleophilic attraction for these guys and these are just a proton looking for an electron. They will actually interact with proteins and other molecules and mess up their structure and their function. So we could refer to those very often as free radicals, something that vitamins can help bind up. Anyway, so we're talking about amino ions, we're talking about hydrogen ions or protons. We're also going to talk about ammonia. So it turns out that this ion and this ion can come together and form a more stable molecule called ammonia. And there's another thing called the ammonium ion, which I can actually attach another hydrogen here because the extra electrons on nitrogen have a very strong attraction for this. So I can actually get this stuff, NH4+, and one of the things I can do is the carbon dioxide that I was talking about earlier and the bicarbonate ion, I can actually combine with some of these things and form a stuff called urea, which is CH4ON2. You know, carbon dioxide, bicarbonate ions, hydrogen ions, and amino groups and ammonia are all very toxic. But if I can combine them into this compound called urea, CH4ON2, it kind of neutralizes, makes less dangerous some of these other, or less toxic, some of these other compounds. And that's one of the primary components in urine is urea. Although we have all of these waste molecules here. Okay. So now, if I'm going to trace these substances through here, what I can say is present in the plasma coming up my um, radiate artery here, I have all my nutrients, I have water, I have ions, and I have the organic waste. As they course through the afferent arterial, I have all four of these compounds, all of this stuff flowing through here. When I get to the glomerulus, I have all four. 
Now, the glomerulus is a unique capillary. We talked a little bit about this when we did blood vessels. Fenestrated capillaries have little holes or openings that allow larger substances through. And there's some specialized cells that we're going to talk about a little bit later. I'm going to draw one on here. And this cell that hugs this is going to be called a podocyte. And these podocytes sit on here. And they help form part of what we call the filtration membrane. So I'll get into the details of the anatomy of that a little bit later. But essentially, this is a fenestrated capillary. And then we have these podocytes, these cells that interlock these little foot pods and make very small filtration slits, okay, called slit pores or filtration slits. And it's sort of like the gaps here between my fingers. And I should have worn a red shirt, but if I put my fingers together like this, you can see the blue of my shirt in between my fingers. If I poked some holes in my shirt, then I would have all these large holes here, and the podocytes cover those fenestrations and make the, the membrane um, have much smaller, tighter openings so that only the smallest substances get out. Okay, So essentially across that filtration membrane, the fluid that's in the blood is called plasma. We know that. But the fluid that's going to be in this space called the capsular space is referred to as filtrate. Okay, And all of this is in my note set. If you're following along in my note set, I'm actually going to be doing the urinary system, the principles of renal physiology on page 89. So as long as the blood, the fluid's in here, it's plasma. But once it comes out across the filtration membrane here, what's going to come out is going to be a substance called filtrate. Filtrate has all four compounds in it. It's got water. It's got, ion, um, uh, it's got nutrients, ions, uh, water, nutrients, water, ions, and trash are all in this filtrate. So I actually have all of those things starting to come into my proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, so I got one, two, three, and four all in the filtrate that's formed. Now, as the fluid drains through the renal corpuscle into the proximal convoluted tubule, and as it runs through the, the renal tubule, it's now called tubular fluid. Okay, let me draw something one more time. A little side note here, I'm going to erase it in a second. If I could slice through the proximal convoluted tubule, then I would have all these little brush border cells in here, the simple cuboidal epithelium. This would be my tubular fluid. This fluid out here would be called peritubular fluid. And anything that gets pulled out of the peri out of the tubular fluid will end up in the peritubular fluid out here. Well, guess what? This peritubular capillary is not sitting way up here. It's actually wrapped all the way around the renal tubule. And so I would have all these capillaries around here. So anything that gets pulled out of the tubular fluid into the peritubular fluid can then enter back into my bloodstream and remain in the body. So plasma filtrate inside the Bowman's capsule in the capsular space, but once it enters the proximal convoluted tubule and stays in the tubule, until it gets to the collecting duct, we call it tubular fluid. I'm going to be using the terms tubular fluid, peritubular fluid, and now you know what I mean. So now, as I enter the proximal convoluted tubule, I have all of these substances. Now, does a little bit stay in here? Absolutely. We cannot pull 100% of the water out or else this would be a dry vessel. There's plasma, there's some water there, but we do pull some water out. Now, as all of this is going through here, the function of the proximal convoluted tubule is going to be the reabsorption of several things. One of the first things we pull out is we get 100% of the nutrients. Almost 100% of the nutrients are captured before we get into the loop of Henle, especially the thin part. I don't even want to risk losing glucose and amino acids over here. So all the transport molecules in the, in the walls of those cells are going to transport glucose and amino acids and fatty acids and glycerol and other things all the way back into the peritubular fluid, back into the bloodstream. Okay. Then we're going to get some water. And we're going to get, it's estimated somewhere between 70 and 75% of the water. But again, it depends on which nephron. So we'll just put about 70% of the water. And... For number three, we're going to get what's called variable reabsorption. 
Variable reabsorption means we're going to reabsorb varying amounts depending on how much salt we've eaten that day and how much our body needs to retain. So the percentages we're not going to put. We get 100% of nutrient reabsorption at the proximal convoluted tubule, roughly 70 to 75% of the water reabsorbed, and variable reabsorption of ions. We do not reabsorb any of the waste, although every now and then we can reuptake some urea, but that's negligible and we're not going to worry about that. You can learn those details if you take a higher level physiology course. So when I get into the descending limb of the loop of Henle, I should not have any of the nutrients available. I have water, I have ions, and I have waste. It turns out that the thin limb, the thin, the thin portion of the descending loop of Henle is going to be permeable to water. We're going to pull a whole bunch of water out here. And we get another 20 to 25 percent of the water. So roughly 90 to 95 percent of the water that we could reabsorb is reabsorbed between the proximal convoluted tubule and the descending limb of the loop of Henle. Now, if I start to pull all the water out, what happens to the substances in there? For example, if I have a bucket of water here and I have stuff dissolved in it, like ions, and I have a whole bunch of toxins dissolved in it, by the time I get to the bottom of the loop of Henle, if I've pulled a lot of the water out, I'm still going to have some of my ions, but I'm going to have all this waste. The same number of waste molecules, but now less liquid. So essentially, the loop of Henle is concentrating the tubular fluid by pulling the water out. Now, as it starts to rise up the ascending limb, I do have a little bit of water. You never want to eliminate 100% of the water or else the salts and other things will crystallize and form kidney stones and clog up the ureters and, um, I mean, clog up the um, uh, nephrons or get caught in the collecting ducts or caught in the uh, renal papilla or somewhere along the tract and block the flow of urine. You don't want that, okay? So we can never reabsorb 100% of the water. We can do that. Actually, we can. We don't want to. You can do it if you don't consume enough water. So drinking lots of water every day, you know, 8, 8 ounce gallon, 8, 8 ounce glasses a day or about a gallon of water a day minimum. Or if you drink the little 20 ounce bottled waters, then you should be drinking about three, or three to four of those every day in addition to anything else you take in so that we continue to flush our kidneys. So nonetheless, as we come up the ascending limb, we still have a little bit of water, we have some ions, and we have all of our waste. Now, these cells over here happen to be rich in pumps for ions. They have ion pumps, and what they're going to pump out is a whole bunch of these ions. And as I pump all these salts out, all this sodium and chloride, it makes this area outside the tube salty, which, by the way, that osmolarity, that amount of salt in here, is going to increase how much water I pull out of the next batch. That's going to concentrate that next batch of, of filtrate coming through here, or tubular fluid, and as it comes back up, I'm going to pull a lot of the ions out. By the time I pull out the water and the ions, what I'm left with over here is nothing but waste and a little bit of water. Very, very concentrated waste called urine so that I only have to pee out a little bit of fluid to get rid of all the toxins. And I conserve all the water and the nutrients here. So under normal conditions, we reabsorb 100% of our nutrients in the proximal convoluted tubule roughly about 70 to 75 percent of the water, and we get variable reabsorption of ions. When I get to the descending limb of the loop of Henle, the thin descending limb is where I reabsorb more water, roughly another 20 to 25 percent, depending, and more ions in the thick ascending loop is where I do more variable ion reabsorption. So I could put variable reabsorption here, okay? So essentially, by the time I get to the distal convoluted tubule, I got a little bit of water, a little bit of salt, but 100% of the waste. And that's what ends up in the collecting duct and ends up in the minor calyx, the major calyx, the, ure the, the renal pelvis, the ureter, the bladder, the urethra, and then wherever you release it. It is estimated, if we look at the normal human glomerular filtration rate, 
which is affected by blood pressure and blood volume and other things. But under normal circumstances, we filter somewhere between 50 and 55 gallons of fluid a day, one of those big blue 55-gallon drums. We don't pee out anywhere near that much. Thank goodness we reabsorb a lot of the stuff, and we only pee out about a half a gallon per day. If you add up all the fluid that you urinate out on a regular basis, on average, it's about a half a gallon. So our kidneys are really working overtime to clean our blood and keep us nice and healthy to prevent sepsis. Okay? So you guys need to know these things. Under normal conditions, we do most of our 100% of nutrient and most water reabsorption and variable ion reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule. We reabsorb a significant chunk of water in the um, distal convoluted tubule, sorry, in the, in the descending limb of the loop of Henle and the thin descending limb. The thick ascending limb gives us variable reabsorption of salt. And then by the time I get to the distal convoluted tubule, I'm pretty much done with everything. I should be pretty well balanced out under normal conditions. And then that's the stuff that ends up in the collecting duct and ends up as urine. Okay. Now, this right here is referred to as counter current multiplication. Counter current because they're flowing in opposite directions. And multiplication because as I pump all the ions out of one um, volume of water coming up here, there's a fresh volume coming down here. That saltiness outside in the, tube, in the peritubular fluid creates an osmotic pressure, a pulling pressure, that's going to pull water out of the next batch coming down and concentrate it. So the amount of salt being pumped out of the ascending limb is multiplying how much water gets pulled out of the descending limb. And since they're flowing in opposite directions, they're multiplying each other's effect. The more water I pull out, the more salt I have to pull out also, or else it could crystallize. Now that's going to multiply the next batch of fluid coming through. That saltiness will pull water out. That will pump out more salt from that same batch. And then the next batch comes through. They're, they have a multiplying effect on each other. The amount of salt I pump out multiplies the amount of water that I pull out, which increases the amount of salt that I have to pump out of the next batch, and so on and so forth. And they just keep multiplying each other, and they flow in opposite directions, countercurrent multiplication. That is where we concentrate our urine very much um, so in the loop of Henle. That's the main function of the loop of Henle. Countercurrent multiplication concentrates urine, so a little tiny bit of urine has all the waste very concentrated. Okay, So... Um, there's three major principles that we're going to talk about. There's glomerular filtration. That is filtering fluids across the filtration membrane to form the filtrate. There's tubular reabsorption, which is the reabsorption of all these nutrients and ions and water. And there's another concept called tubular secretion. And it turns out, I'm going to change colors so that you can see this, that we can actually pull out of this capillary bed some excess potassium ions, some excess bicarbonate ions, some excess ammonia ions from other things that are happening, they can actually be pulled out of the capillary bed and dumped into the distal convoluted tubule. And that pulling out of the body and getting it into the tubule is called tubular secretion. So if you look up the definition on page 89, it gives you these three definitions, glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and then tubular secretion. This is where we're going to get rid of excess, I put ammonia, it's not ammonia ions, it's hydrogen ions. Okay? We get rid of excess potassium and hydrogen ions in the distal convoluted tubule. We secrete it into it, and then that actually ends up being peed out as well. Okay? So you should know all of this information that's on page 89. That is a significant portion of your test. Now, when it comes to this table, you can put a little check mark or a yes or a plus and a minus or a no or a um, negative mark for all of these substances or a comment for them. For example, we need to know what's present in the filtrate. Is water present in filtrate? You betcha. Okay. And the comment is we reabsorb roughly 90 to 95 percent of it from the proximal convoluted tubule and the descending limb of the loop of Henle. For nutrients, they are present in the filtrate and we get 100 percent reabsorption 
at the proximal convoluted tubule. So you can fill that in in the comments. 100% reabsorption of nutrients occurs at the proximal convoluted tubule. For sodium chloride and potassium ions, yes, they are present in the filtrate. Yes, hydrogen ions are. Okay, They're all present in filtrate. The comments are, we get variable reabsorption of most of those. For sodium, potassium, and chloride, we get variable reabsorption throughout the tract, okay? Particularly in the proximal convoluted tubule and the ascending limb of loop of Henle. And then for hydrogen ions, we secrete them through tubular secretion into the distal convoluted tubule. Urea is formed in here also, and we're not gonna worry about urea. You should never, ever have blood cells and you should never have plasma proteins end up in the filtrate. We don't even want to risk losing plasma proteins like albumins and fibrinogens and antibodies and we don't want to lose glucose or other nutrients. So they should not be present in your urine. They don't even make it into the filtrate, most of them, uh, particularly blood cells and plasma proteins. We do have glucose and nutrients there. But you never want to lose blood cells, you never want to lose protein they stay in the system and are never filtered across the membrane, okay? If you do have blood in your urine, they call that hematuria or hematuria, and that is not a good sign. This means there's a problem here. You should also not have protein. Trace amounts, maybe, but you usually should not have any protein in your urine, plasma proteins in particular. Now, we're going to talk about the filtration membrane and the glomerulus in the next video, and we're going to talk about filtration pressures and how all of this stuff works, okay? There is a definition on the bottom of page 90. What is renal failure? Renal failure is the inability of the kidney to filter your blood and clean it. Okay. Um, also, uh, we're going to do a couple of other things um, in here. Now, one of the last things I want to point out, and then I'm going to do another video, and we're going to have to talk about this whole nephron some more, is this. These are all normal conditions. All of this is happening under normal conditions. If you have problems with blood volume and blood pressure, then we can reabsorb a little bit more of the water to help raise blood volume and blood pressure. That is going to be done by hormones that bind to the distal convoluted tubule and increase permeability of water and or ions here. Some of the proteins here, by the way, are called aquaporins, like pores in your skin, but they're for water. And there's proteins in the distal convoluted tubule to which certain hormones can bind. For example, if your blood volume and blood pressure are low and renal blood flow is low, we're not going to filter our blood as rapidly. If I don't have enough pressure forcing these ions out and all this trash and filtrate out, then a lot of it could stay in here. Think about it this way. Okay, um, I'm going to erase all of those compounds over there. I want to give you a simple concept. And we're going to talk about all of this in detail in the next video. Okay, but... If I think about this capillary like a water hose going into a sprinkler, let's say we have one of those little round sprinklers with the holes in the top, and then the water hose can come out the other side. The amount of pressure, if I turn the, the faucet handle all the way open, then I'm going to be squirting fluid under a great deal of pressure. I'm going to get more water out over time. If I turn the pressure down, then the fluid barely dribbles out, and a lot of it makes it through. So having our blood pressure in a specific range, too high is bad, too low is bad. If it's too high, then I form filtrate so rapidly and it flies through here so quick, the transport proteins can't pull the molecules out of the filtrate and we might lose some valuable nutrients. If the blood pressure is too low, I'm not even going to be filtering stuff out. A lot of the trash and toxins can stay in my bloodstream. So our body has a, several hormones that all target the distal convoluted tubule of the renal tubules, of the kidney tubules. ADH will increase water reabsorption. Aldosterone will increase salt and water reabsorption. We increase salt reabsorption at the distal convoluted tubule. Water follows the salt. And if blood pressure is too high, atrial natriuretic peptide, if you remember this hormone when we did the right atrium of the heart, atrial natriuretic peptide, the natriuretic means to pee salt. Actually, A and P helps you pee NA or sodium. So it will pull sodium out, water follows the salt, and it will increase the amount of urine that you form, lowering your blood volume and blood pressure. Okay? So we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. And I'm going to write those details in over here. All right. 
You know what? Let me just do it right here now. Okay, we'll just finish this up on this video. So here's my special conditions. Put a little asterisk here. And this is going to occur at the distal convoluted tubule. If blood volume and blood pressure are low, then ADH increases water reabsorption at the distal convoluted tubule. Now that's my shorthand, but I'm going to repeat it. If blood volume and blood pressure are too low, and we're not filtering properly, we have to raise blood pressure. One way to do that is that our brain, our hypothalamus, will monitor blood volume and blood pressure. And if blood pressure is too low, then the, at the posterior pituitary, we secrete ADH, antidiuretic hormone, stop peeing hormone. ADH will target the distal convoluted tubule and cause us to pull even what little bit of water that's left and will reabsorb that so that you stop urinating and you maintain more water, raising your blood volume and blood pressure. A second backup to that is if blood pressure and blood volume are low and extremely low, this fails, or we have decreased renal blood flow. Then aldosterone, if you remember from my um, endocrine video, and I have one, I'll put it on YouTube. We call it salty aldo because it works on salt. Aldosterone will target the distal convoluted tubule. It will cause us to pull in more salt. Water follows the salt, and that will raise blood volume and blood pressure. Now, what's unique about this is that there are cells here at the opening of the um, glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule, um, and that structure is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. We will talk about it again. But there's some special cells here that are monitoring the pressure and some cells in the distal convoluted tubule that when they don't have enough pressure on them, they release the hormone renin. Renin converts angiotensin 1, or angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, that goes through the lungs. Angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, converts that to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 goes to the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal gland and causes the release of aldosterone. Aldosterone targets the distal convoluted tubule of the kidney and increases salt and water reabsorption. All that's written in the note set, and you should know that backwards and forwards. By the way, the coronavirus binds to the ACE protein in what are called um, uh, pneumocytes, cells in your lungs called pneumocytes, type 2 pneumocytes, have the ACE um, proteins in their membrane, which is an enzyme that converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. It also helps produce a, pr a fluid that covers your lungs called surfactant. Surfactant prevents the lungs from collapsing by creating some tension, some fluid tension there. Um, the coronavirus binds to the ACE molecules, the ACE proteins, and it actually, I believe, prevents the production of surfactant, and it be the lungs will start to collapse. It becomes harder to breathe as the alveoli start to collapse down on themselves. You can't get respiration going. You can't get oxygen transport. And that's how um, the coronavirus actually um, affects our respiratory system, causing respiratory distress syndrome. Anyway, um, so aldosterone does that. Finally, of the, the third hormone that I'm going to talk about, and I'll change the color, is atrial natriuretic peptide. So it is released if blood pressure and blood volume are elevated for a long period of time. And that will target the distal convoluted tubule and cause us to release more salt and water. Actually, it causes us to reabsorb salt, water, ah, sorry. Aldosterone causes salt and water reabsorption. A and P causes you to pee out the sodium and water follows the sodium and the chloride and increases water loss. Um, so A and P will target the distal convoluted tubule to increase sodium chloride and water loss in urine. 
I know that's not pretty. It's all messy on the corner of the board, but that's what happens, okay? So you need to know these three special conditions. Under normal conditions, the only thing that happens to the distal convoluted tubule is tubular secretion, the loss of excess potassium and hydrogen ions here. But under, um, under I shouldn't have even put bicarbonate. Under special conditions, if blood volume and blood pressure are too low, then ADH targets the distal convoluted tubule and increases water reabsorption. If renal blood flow is, de is affected and our blood pressure is really low, aldosterone um, through the renin-angiotensin pathway targets the distal convoluted tubule, increases salt reabsorption, water follows the salt, raises blood pressure. And atrial natriuretic, pe uretic peptide is an, uh, an antagonist to aldosterone, does the exact opposite. It targets the distal convoluted tubule and increases sodium and chloride loss. Water follows the salt and it lowers our blood volume and blood pressure. All right. There are a few other conditions where we can alter all this, but that is a very large majority of the information you need to know. What is happening? What gets reabsorbed where in the entire process and the three special hormones that affect the distal convoluted tubule. All right. So listen, I hope you learned something. I hope this was helpful. I hope you had as much fun as I did because I love talking about this stuff. Our, the human body is absolutely astounding. And if anyone tells you you're not attractive or finds you, tells you something mean about you, tell them, you know what? You have never seen my glomerulus and my Bowman's capsule, baby. They are beautiful. They are sexy and they keep my body functioning beautifully. So anyway, I hope you had some fun with AMP and I will see you on the flip side in the next video on the urinary system. Thanks for watching.